and a half, we're going to have an extended conversation up here on stage, but also with you on the question, is religious freedom universal? And I hope you can sense, those of you who've been with us uh, so far today, how this question builds on the conversations we've held this morning when we looked at the history of religious freedom as a concept, as a reality across different traditions, and just now in the keynote debate, uh, where we focused more on the American experience, the relationship between law, uh, history, religion, uh, and politics. Now we want to kind of go global uh, and ask this very open-ended question, but I think critical question, in the context of uh, how this issue is playing out on a global stage. We know it's part of American foreign policy. That was alluded to in the last panel. It's increasingly a part of human rights agendas within, within international institutions. Uh, it's increasingly playing out in our media. And what we thought we'd do is, um, together with John Finnis, Peter Danchin, and Moda Siddiqui, pose this larger question, is religious freedom universal? Uh, you'll notice in your program, there are a couple subsidiary questions we also want to address to sort of narrow that down just a little bit. Uh, how universal or culturally portable is religious freedom? What core principles of religious freedom, if any, are universally applicable around the world and in the West? Uh, and those two are, of course, very broad questions. And I just want to surface uh, some of the complexities uh, uh, for a couple of minutes that I think link back to key issues that have arisen so far during our conversation today. One, of course, and I, I'm anticipating we'll address these issues in our conversation. One, of course, is the question of definition. What do we mean by religious freedom? Uh, we've talked already about its various dimensions, the level of belief, the level of worship and practice, but also the social and political dimension of religious freedom. We've touched on religious freedom as both an individual right and a, as a collective right. Uh, and we'll want to come back to that, I'm sure, in our conversation today as we place things in a more universal frame. And then, of course, uh, we won't get around the question that we addressed in some depth just now over lunch of how religious freedom relates to other rights, economic, social, and political, and to larger questions of social and political order. I think the biggest distinction, the biggest issue I want to anticipate, uh, because uh, I know it often sows confusion in discussions of the international dimension of religious freedom, is to try as best we can to sort out, if not keep distinct, the, the empirical and normative dimensions of the question. Uh, is religious freedom something that is, as a matter of fact, endorsed and applied universally around the world, across world regions? That's the empirical question. The normative question is, of course, should it be? Uh, should it be endorsed? Should it be applied around the world? So I look forward to a conversation around these questions. I'll briefly introduce the speakers. They'll each uh, propose five to 10 minutes of introductory remarks. I'll then try to provoke some discussion here on stage, and we'll be sure to have enough time for conversations and discussion from the audience. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, John Finnis to my left, who's the Beal Cheney Family Professor of Law at Notre Dame University and Professor of Law and legal philosophy at Oxford University, a world-renowned scholar known to most everyone in this room who's worked in many different areas, including natural law theory. And next to him is Peter Danchin, associate professor of law and the director of the International and Comparative Law Program at the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, and Peter is also a leader of what I would call a parallel a project to ours, uh, a project on international religious freedom that's being um, developed and pursued under the auspices of the Luce Foundation. And to my far left, Mona Siddiqui, uh, who is professor of Islamic studies and public understanding, professor of Islamic studies and public understanding and founding director of the Center for the Study of Islam at the University of Glasgow. And Mona is also a member of our religious freedom team. She is with us as an associate scholar. So thank you all for being here. I look forward to the conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Finnis. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you, you can see in uh, the booklet that is around on page 22 my statement uh, about this. And I thought I'd just go through that quickly 
relocating it in its original format, which was as the response to three questions, and, and the chairman has just reminded us of those, but I'll, I'll put them, and then you'll see how my response was uh, to, the, to the questions. So the first question was, how universal or culturally portable is religious freedom? And my response was, there is a natural or human, and I'm using these two terms as essentially synonymous, uh, there is a natural or human right to religious freedom, which as natural or human is inherently universal, that is, ought to be acknowledged by any society, even those societies whose cultural development does not yet enable members of the society to recognize such a category of human relationships as a natural human right and even those societies whose culture denies the truth of such categories or the inclusion of religious freedom within the category of human rights. So there's a, a if you like, bluntly normative answer in which I'm proposing as true, something I want to defend, uh, regardless of the huge cultural diversity of answers that are given to that question. I'm, I'm as aware as anyone of that diversity, but that wasn't what I was interested in portraying or recalling or reciting or sifting amongst. I just went straight to the proposition I want to defend. And I said, secondly, it's inherently portable, but the radical or partial opposition to it in certain cultures, for example, Marxist culture, Islamic culture, medieval Catholic culture, classical Puritan culture, Lockean in respect of Catholics and atheists and so forth, is such that it has been and is culturally portable only on condition that such cultures undergo reform and conversion in at least this respect. Okay, so then the second question was, what core principles of religious freedom, if any, are universally applicable, not only across the diversity of the world's cultures and religions, but even across the diverse societies and experiences of the West. And I ventured to say the core principle is that everyone has the natural or human right not to be coerced in seeking the truth about religious matters, that is, religious matters, that is, about matters concerned with the question whether there is or is not a transcendent source of the cosmos including of human freedom and capacities, and with answers negative or positive to that question. Or, and these re religious matters include not only the, the ask, asking of the question and the answering of the question, but also in putting the results of that search into practice, for example, by proclamation and worship, including public proclamation and worship, if that's what the answer suggests. This is a right whose entailed correlative is a duty of other persons and groups, including state government and law, not to engage in such coercion, either with intent to restrict such seeking or without sufficient reason, as a side effect of prohibiting or restricting activities which have a public impact. And there's sufficient reason for coercion only when, first of all, its intent is to prohibit or restrict activities to the extent necessary to preserve public order, that is, the rights of others, including their right to religious freedom, public peace and public morality, including just constitutional order within the category of public morality. And secondly, there's sufficient reason for coercion uh, only when, secondly, such steps are indeed no more extensive or coercive of religious practice than is needed for that purpose of protecting uh, public order in the rather rich sense of, of the term that I just specified. The right is not that public authorities should be neutral as between religions, and such neutrality may well be incompatible with public order in some contexts. But government favor for a religion may easily take forms which amount to coercion in the relevant sense nor is the right that there be no establishment of religion or a religion. But again, such establishment may readily take a form tantamount to coercion. Nor does the right entail separation of church or other religious congregations, 
and state. But a sharp distinction between the sacred and the secular is part of the matrix in which the right to religious freedom becomes, at least historically, acknowledged. And so finally, the, the third question was, what is the relationship between a universally recognizable notion of human dignity and religious freedom? And I said, a principal moral political basis for affirming the right is the inherent human dignity of being capable of seeking and finding truth about cosmic and human origins and ends. Dignity is always a term that, that connotes that one is, we are above something else. So we have human dignity because unlike other animals, we are animals, but unlike all other kinds of animals, we can, for example, search for the truth about ultimate questions. And that's our, or a main part of our dignity. Uh, and this uh, capacity of ours entails the duty of participating in that activity as a good-oriented activity, an activity oriented towards the good, in particular the good of truth about these great questions. Answerable in our activity to nothing but the truth, as one responsibly judges that it emerges from the grounds, the reasons, the evidences, the arguments, and so forth, for affirming it, whatever you judge is to be affirmed. So the relevant notions, truth, the intrinsic goodness of truth, the duty of seeking that good, that truth, and of being responsible in one's inquiries into it, and the radical human capacity not shared with subhuman creatures for seeking and finding it, these are universally recognizable in principle even in cultures where such a recognition would require abandonment of certain culturally entrenched beliefs which block such recognition. So that's what you find on pages 22 and 23. Now, uh, the, the statement that I made, the articulation I gave of the content of this right to religious freedom from coercion does track very closely uh, Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, less closely, for a reason that I'll mention in a moment, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and closely the Second Vatican Council's uh, Dignitatis Humanae, which I mentioned earlier, uh, on religious liberty. The the difference between the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and, and on the one hand, and, and for that matter, the European Convention, and on the other hand, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is one that might, one might not notice at first reading. Uh, Article 18 says everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and so forth, the freedom of practice, and so forth. And the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, 1952, Article 9, includes the same phrase. This, uh, this right of, to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and so forth. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, dropped that reference to changing one's religion. It said everyone shall have the right to freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. And of course, you could read into the phrase of his choice, uh, uh, the choice to opt out of the religion that you had once had. But the reason why what was in the Universal Declaration and the European Convention was not included in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, I think historically is clear that the Islamic countries were unwilling to see an explicit reference to changing one's religion. And one can understand that in the light of of the Cairo Declaration by the 57 states, which uh, in some way regard themselves as Islamic, although some of them are not under Islamic governments or even have Islamic majorities. The Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam in 1990, Article 10, which is the article about where, which if, anyone, if any of the articles does, deals with uh, religious freedom, says, Islam is the religion of true unspoiled nature, which is rather mysterious in English. Uh, um, the French perhaps is a little clearer. La religion de l'innate. So it's the innate religion of every human 
being, it is prohibited to exercise any form of pressure on man or to exploit his poverty or ignorance in order to force him to change his religion to another religion or to atheism. So you take the and that, that's the end of it. And take that in its context, including its historic context of, of being a declaration on human rights issued after all these international covenants. It's pretty clear that the sense of Article 10 is that there is no freedom to change from the religion that everyone innately belongs to. So, uh, that, whether or not I'm right in that uh, interpretation, at least introduces a, an aspect of religious freedom which I think uh, is worth dwelling on and has become of particular importance in European uh, discussions of uh, and, and rulings on religious liberty. And uh, some of these have been mentioned here today in terms which suggest a, a, a significant gulf between American thinking or the thinking taken for granted around here uh, and European thinking, uh, it's just obviously absurd or affront to religious liberty to restrict uh, the freedom of someone to wear a, a garment of, of their choice. That was the sort of gist of the, uh, the sentiment uh, I heard here earlier. Uh, the European Court on hum uh, Human Rights uh, unanimously, 18 judges, unanimously decided that uh, in two cases in, in, in relation to Turkey, one, one related to the wearing of, of veils and the prohibition of the wearing of Islamic scarves uh, in medical schools. And uh, this was required of medical schools by the Turkish Constitutional Court and by legislation uh, in line with the rulings of the Constitutional Court, and all that was upheld by the European Court of Human Rights on the ground that it was necessary to, uh, to establish this prohibition. Well, there are several grounds, but one of the most important is that to, to protect the liberty of those who do not wish to wear the scarves the symbols from the pressures that would be exerted on them if it were permissible to wear them, the pressures that would be exerted on them outside the university. Just outside the university, as they came out of the university, they would be spotted by vigilantes uh, who would see that they're not wearing the scarf uh, and they would be pressured. Or from within their families or from within a dynamic Islamic party, political parties uh, in, inside Turkey. Uh, of course, the, the even stronger decision of the European Court was that uh, the governing party of Turkey should be dissolved and the government dismissed, as it was dissolved and, and dismissed, uh, because it intended to introduce Sharia law, that is to say Islamic law, either, and this was unclear, as the law of Turkey or the re relevant religious law of all Turkish citizens, or as the law for Muslims in Turkey, but not for uh, other members of other religions. And the European Court said that, that winding up of the party and dismissal of the government was permissible in the interests of all the human rights protected by the European Convention, since if Sharia were instituted, that would be a comprehensive violation of numerous rights, including the right to religious liberty. Now, obviously, that kind of judgment depends on a series of, of fa as it were, factual historical propositions which could easily be wrong or right, but which go far outside the competence of moral moralists or lawyers as such, or international lawyers as such, or po political theorists as such, and involve a series of very hands-on judgments about what is likely to happen, uh, and indeed uh, so some reference to the as it were, public meaning of teachings in documents, uh, religious documents and political documents. So uh, the important thing I want to bring out is that the universal right to religious liberty is a right to freedom from coercion, not only by the state, but also by the members of your own religious association. Very important right. Uh, 
and against uh, freedom from coercion by other people, including members of your extended family uh, or other civil associations. Thank you. Peter? <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Tom and Tim and the Berkeley Center for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, my, my remarks actually are going to follow very nicely from what Professor Finnis uh, just indicated. Um, he discussed uh, the Sahin and the, and the Refah Partizi cases. Um, and I, I, see, I read these cases quite differently, and I want to try to explain why. Uh, the two issues that he raised of legal pluralism in, in Refah um, and freedom, what we mean by freedom uh, and freedom of religion in Sahin are really the two issues that have occupied me for the last few years. Uh, and I want to try to discuss these two questions um, in the context of another very interesting case uh, recently decided by the European Court, the Grand Chamber, in fact, uh, the Laozi case, Italy uh, versus Laozi, uh, which was decided in, in March, which involves the uh, public presence, the presence of the crucifix in public school classrooms in Italy. Uh, and I think the, uh, the Laozi case actually is a very helpful way in to thinking about these very complicated uh, questions. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm currently involved in a research project looking at the international dimensions of religious freedom. Uh, and the, the full title of that is Relig The Politics of Religious Freedom, Contested Norms and Local Practices. And the title gives a sense as to what interests me uh, about this. We're looking at South Asia, um, uh, at Europe, and also at uh, the Middle East, in particular Egypt at the moment, which is a fascinating uh, country to consider these questions. Um, and the, my basic thesis today um, is that I see the right to religious freedom not as a singular stable principle, which we can think of in some sense as existing outside of culture or spatial geographies or power, in particular power. Uh, but instead, if we look at it, both normatively and uh, in practice, we see that it is a highly contested polyvalent concept, not a single concept, which is unfolding uh, within the histories of concrete political orders. And so these are my two basic uh, arguments that to really gain an appreciation of the right to religious freedom, we need to think of it as evolving within history. Um, and we had a sense of that, I think, in, in the previous panel, historically relative in a sense, um, and at the same time normatively plural. Um, and here international law is actually very interesting because international law, all the documents that Professor Finnis cited, reflect some genuine contestation at the normative level uh, by what we mean by the right to religious freedom. Now, I, I've set out my comments in the, um, uh, in the, in the brochure that you have, and I, I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, but what I argue there, in essence, is that the genius and the power of the discourse of religious freedom is that it defines political authority in terms of some notion of secular neutrality. And it defines the right itself in terms of individual freedom. Now, I think both of these propositions are, are contested. And I know Professor Finnis rejects the first. Um, but if you look at most writing today, uh, it seems to follow these two uh, dimensions. And it's the dialectic between neutrality and freedom that maintains the power of the discourse and the, uh, the need to assemble at occasions like this. Um, what this means is that the public sphere uh, whether we think of the public sphere of different states or the public sphere of international law itself, is dynamically related to the scope of the right to religious freedom. Uh, the discourse is able to maintain its simultaneous claims to uniqueness, because supposedly neutral towards religion, and universal, because securing the right to religious freedom, by constantly defining each of these terms in, e in terms of the other. And you see this if you look at the jurisprudence carefully, there is an ingenious switching, constant dialectic, as I call it, uh, which defines neutrality in terms of the right and the right in terms of neutrality. And I want to illustrate this uh, with, the, with the Lao Tse case. If I'm correct about this, then both logos and nomos, uh, in philosophical terms, are ineliminably contextual and evolving within different sites of contestation. Nomian neutrality in any particular decision-making context quickly devolves into hypostasis or reification of an historically specific political order. And the European Convention is, is perhaps the, the clearest illustration of this. Uh, 
we get a very clear sense of what religion and belief means within that jurisprudence and very particular demarcations of spheres. Conversely, any accounts of reason, uh, claims to natural reason or universal reason, if we view them across time, we see considerable shifts in interpretation and indeed warring intellectual traditions slugging it out internal to the concept of the right itself. In other words, uh, there are conflicts, normative conflicts, and rival intellectual conceptions of the right uh, existing at any moment in time. Um, and you see the, the judges struggling over this as well. So I, I set out a very tedious and long argument explaining how the early modern period in Europe led to a conception of religious freedom in terms of social peace and led to the very complex uh, religious settlements that we see in Europe today. This derived from a, a civil philosophy um, that sought to desacralize the state and led over time to the spiritualization of religion. And Ian Hunter actually uh, in Australia has done incredible work at looking at this early uh, modern period. If you look later though into the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, you see a quite different liberal tradition emerging which advances a moral theory of justice which, which grounds religious liberty in a complex and highly unstable notion of freedom of conscience. And what I've argued is that today we have a quite unique situation where freedom of conscience, in effect, is defined as, as autonomy uh, by the law. We think of conscience in terms of autonomy, and it's this dialectic that shapes much of the uh, legal decision making we see. What's fascinating about this later tradition, which I associate most strongly with the Kantian tradition, is that it's a metaphys metaphysical uh, philosophical tradition that simultaneously sacralizes reason and rationalizes religion. It redefines what we mean by religion and a proper religious subjectivity and completely changes the, the, the name of the game, as it were. Uh, and again, it's that tradition, I think, that is the legacy of much of the way uh, liberal uh, human rights views are advanced today. Uh, what I want to suggest is that whether one views religious freedom in terms of social peace, and of course we could do away with the language of freedom uh, and think about this more in terms of peaceful relations between differently situated groups, um, uh, whether one thinks in those terms and in the very jurisdictional terms of the European tradition, the older European tradition, or whether we think in terms of freedom, uh, each of these uh, intellectual traditions ev evolved internally to what we might think broadly as Western, Western Christianity um, and are the, are the legacies we, we, uh, we deal with today. So one very real question in my work is what is the uh, universality of any of these traditions once we get outside of a broadly North Atlantic Western Christian context? Uh, and this is where Refa, Sahin, and Lao Tzu are all enormously uh, illuminating. Okay, well, let me just say a few words about uh, Lao Tzu. Of course, uh, famously in 2009, the second chamber held that the compulsory display of crucifixes in uh, public schools in Italy violated the right of children to religious freedom under Article 9. The court said that this restricted the right of school ch children uh, to believe or not to believe. Uh, this, was, this was quite fascinating. I thought Professor, Professor Finnis would be interested in those words. Uh, the decision, of course, was met with outrage in Italy and many orthodox states, and an appeal was launched in the grand, uh, to the Grand Chamber. Uh, in interestingly, the, uh, the person who represented the intervening states, most, many of whom were orthodox, was Professor uh, Joseph Weiler at, uh, at NYU. Uh, what Weiler zeroed in on was the Second Chamber's reasoning uh, uh, which was central to their holding, that the state's duty of neutrality and impartiality is incompatible with any kind of power on its part to assess the legitimacy of religious conviction or the ways of expressing those convictions. And of course, as Weiler pointed out, that once one frames the question in that way, the case is over. It's quite clear that placing a crucifix mandatorily on the wall of a classroom in, is an assessment of the legitimacy of a particular religious tradition. And therefore, the question of neutrality, the proper way to understand neutrality, became the central point of disagreement uh, in the Grand Chamber. Now, what Weiler argued was that we need to think about neutrality in more complex terms, in terms of both individual and collective rights, and in, in terms of the rich European tradition of diversity, 
of religious values which I mentioned uh, earlier. In other words, there was not a single religious liberty claim at issue in Lao Tzu. There was also the collective liberty claim of a state and a people to define its own uh, uh, way of life and society in terms of religion and religious symbols, even to the extent of having an established or official religion as still today in the United Kingdom and Greece and Denmark, all members of the Council of Europe. Well, uh, the Grand Chamber agreed with Professor Weiler. Of course, the difficulty they then faced was how to reconcile their agreement uh, with this pluralistic proposition with their prior jurisprudence, which of course in Sahin and in Rafah had imposed very strict standards of both individual right and neutrality in terms of secularity, as well as explaining why the second chamber was incorrect. Well, this is what I think is most interesting, and, and I'll conclude with these, uh, with these two observations. On the question of neutrality, uh, and this is really, I think, tremendously suggestive, they said that the presence of the crucifix did not impinge or, or infringe the principle of neutrality because the crucifix is an essentially passive symbol. It cannot be deemed to have an influence on pupils comparable to that of didactic speech or participation in religious activities. Now, of course, you can see here immediately a particular notion of what religion is in this conception, a notion of conscience or inner belief. Mrs. Lauzi's children were free to believe or not to believe as they, as they chose to do. And again, the ambiguity between freedom of conscience and autonomy was left open uh, by the court. But what this type of interpretation does is that almost invisibly, it naturalizes a particular religious tradition, which I want to suggest is broadly Christian in its genealogy here. Now, to make this point clearly, think about the court's earlier decision in Dalab versus Switzerland. This case involved a convert to Islam uh, in a Swiss public school who sought to teach a uh, veil, wearing the, the hijab. In that case, the court found the wearing, the mere wearing of the veil to be a powerful external symbol that could legally be prescribed to protect the religious beliefs of the pupils and their parents and to apply the principle of denominational neutrality in schools. There was no evidence whatsoever in the case of proselytizing. In fact, the teacher went to some lengths to say nothing about her own religious commitments. And there were no complaints by pupils at the school or colleagues uh, or anyone else. Uh, and of course, in this case, you have a teacher uh, manifesting a religious tradition as opposed to the, the state itself adopting a religious symbol. You would think rationally that in that kind of case, there is less danger rather than more uh, of proselytization, pressure, or coercion. So what is it that leads the, the grand chamber, the full court of the European Court of Human Rights, to find that the, con the crucifix is a passive symbol? What, what, it, what does the symbol of the crucifix mean? Well, here the, the, the arguments in the Italian uh, uh, intellectual sphere is qu are quite interesting. For some, it's now part of Italy's civil religion. For others, it's part of Italian culture, kind of like the furniture that might exist in any public space in Europe. For the Italian government itself, uh, the crucifix was a symbol of tolerance, pluralism, and wait for it, religious freedom. The crucifix itself was a symbol of religious freedom. Now, I think in an American setting, this seems very strange. Uh, it's almost as if, as my colleague Winnie Sullivan has argued, to avoid the quandary of the impossibility of religious freedom, the court adopted a tautology, which Robert Yell has, has defined as follows, that religion is already pure freedom, a condition of belief or grace, which by its nature is beyond the reach of the state. The crucifix, in a sense, in every classroom in Italy, uh, is a reminder of Paul's definition of, of true religion as inner life and participation in the divine nature, which identifies some broad notion of Christianity with freedom. Now, as William Connolly has noted in his work in political theory, it's only with the emergence of secularism and Protestantism that we think of a symbol, a religious symbol in this way uh, as becoming a representation of an inner state of belief that precedes it. Uh, and ritual now comes to be understood as some kind of primitive enactment of these beliefs, uh, which could also be displayed through cognitive representation. So 
In this sense, then, the Islamic headscarf is about religious observance and ritual and about external performance. This is not, in fact, true religion. That is the problem for the court. Now, that's a provocative statement, but I think this is the only way one can explain this differential treatment uh, of the interpretation of the, of the, uh, the symbols. Uh, it inappropriately mixes law, nomos, with religion, and in that sense can be prescribed as subject to the regulatory power of the civil magistrate. Um, lastly, and I'll, I know I've spoken too long, um, when they get to the question of the right to religious freedom under Article 9, they say that this falls within the margin of appreciation of the respondent state. The fact that there is no European consensus on the presence of religious symbols, the court says, means that the court must defer to this plurality uh, within European nation states. In other words, while as arguments of collective self-determination, the right of the Italians to determine for themselves the place of religion in the public sphere, to do so with reference to religious heritage, symbols, and in terms of a, a collective identity, the court in a sense, steps back from that, looking down from the lofty supranational sphere of Strasbourg, it says that that is a sphere of freedom for Italy and for other European states to work out as amongst themselves. In other words, you see the court switching back now from a discourse of right, which is not to be interpreted in terms of coercion or universal reason. Rather, this collective notion of right is to be worked out intersubjectively, contextually, between the member states of the Council of Europe, and this is complete with all the complex entanglements and antinomies that we see across the European normative landscape today. Uh, and so, again, you see how the dialectic between neutrality and freedom allows the court to reach some kind of political accommodation of these claims, and that, I think, is what's most interesting about the universality of religious freedom. Thank you very much, Mona. Right, first of all, um, can I thank the Berkeley Center staff for this invitation and also for inviting me to speak um, on this panel. I'm not a legal theorist, I'm not even a lawyer in the modern sense of the word. Uh, I'm a scholar of Islamic jurisprudence and Muslim Christian theological relations. And I suppose one of the reasons I was asked to be an associate scholar, about which I had severe doubts at the beginning. Um, was um, that my interest in my public life, in my public role in the UK, is very much on the interface between religion and society. And as I've gone on with this project and been part of the discussions, I've realised that actually so many of the concerns in the UK and in Europe in general um, may, not be, um, may not be reflected through the concept or the heading of religious freedom, but they are actually about religious freedom in the way we're discussing religious freedom today. One thing I would say, though, is just on the basis of the last two speakers, but also some of the things that were said earlier on, seems to me really quite um, amazing. I, I, I think that's not too strong a word for this. How many of our discussions about religious freedom are reflected or reduced to the headscarf? Um, partly because I think one of the, the biggest problems in Europe, and especially in the UK, but in Europe as a whole, is the visibility of minority religions. Not the presence of minority religions, but the praxis of faith cultures, of minority faith cultures, and how they are seen to be either a problem or contested in the public sphere. I'm just going to be very brief because um, I'd like to have more time for Q&A. But just to pick up on two or three points that I think, as I've been mulling over this whole debate, um, stand out to me as, in this particular context, about the universality of religious freedom, or whether religious freedom is portable as some of the big stumbling blocks. I think many of us value religious freedom. Um, I'm not sure where I put it in the hierarchy of individual freedoms, but we value religious freedom because we argue that democracy is good. And we argue that a rights-based language is good, but not all countries value a rights-based language, and not all cultures value a rights-based language. When we look at Article 18, um, we think of thought and conscience, and I thought to myself, did we need the word religion in it? And I suppose, yes, we did need the word religion in it, because religion expresses itself in praxis 
And that's where it is controversial rather than in thought. We all have the right to believe or not believe in God, but how we express that vision and that belief in God through praxis is what becomes controversial in the public sphere. And then the problem of what is meant by private and public. Um, Slavoj Žižek uh, pointed to this in the WikiLeaks epi events, where he said the problem, the reason why this became so problematic was because in private you can say or talk about or just debate anything you want. As soon as you put it out in the public, it becomes contested. But I'm not sure that when we talk about religious, um, religious expression, that there is such a clear-cut division between private and public. And then I think the biggest dilemma is that what do we actually mean when we talk about religion? Because does the state have a legal definition of what constitutes religion? And I don't think this is just semantics, because such courts of law um, make such decisions. But the, can the court protect something which has not been coherently defined? It may protect religion, but it doesn't obviously define all the time what religion is. We live increasingly in a world of diaspora religious communities in which all religions are everywhere, often governed by largely secular, if not pro-Western, um, pro-Western culturally, not necessarily politically, regimes. Can the state protect religious freedom when there are different ways of defining religion, different ways of practicing the same faith? And can lived religion in all its manifestations really always be protected by the law? The state is not allowed to decide on what counts as religion and what does not, but courts of law are always having to make that decision. Whether it's the veiling, whether it's meat slaughter, whether it's um, the right to take leave of absence on certain religious holidays. These are decisions that are having to be made in the name of religion, when actually there is no national uh, or coherent definition of what religion means. The paradox is that, it, that all the freedoms we talk about today, religious freedom as a given in society, may be something quite unique to Western democracies alone. That is not to say that other religions don't have a sense, of, a developed sense of what freedom of conscience means. But I think the problem with freedom of conscience is, and this is something I've been mulling over myself, is that do you have to be, do you have to have a strong conviction in your own faith before you allow freedom of conscience to others? And is that part of the stumbling block when we, when we come across cultures or religious cultures which may theoretically say we allow freedom of conscience. We allow, our, our religion allows people to convert or apostatize as being used, but that's a really difficult word. But actually, when it comes to the practice of that, there is a sense of apology, there is a sense of defensiveness, because the ability or the freedom to convert from a faith to another is a very emotive and very powerful issue. In a largely post-Christian secular West, the very idea of religion continuing to exert a meaningful hold in public life is, I think, at least in the European context, not just contested, but actually quite resisted. And we've had one or two examples, and I was just thinking of the other more recent example in Scotland where I live, where recently the Scottish government is proposing to legalize marriage for same-sex couples and the Catholic bishops have written, or at least one Catholic bishop has written, saying that the Catholics will no longer vote for the SNP, the Scottish National Party, if this goes ahead. And the kind of furore that this can raise is that why can religion have a public hold? By public, they mean a political hold. Religion is just one voice from a plurality of voices, and religious voices should not be privileged and all day I've been hearing, to some extent, and in varying shades of nuance, that belief or a theistic belief or, or a theistic grounding or a connection with the transcendent is one way, is different from philosophy, is a different form of lifestyle, is a different way of thinking about the world. And I'm sure people who believe agree with that. But I think in the European context, 
if we think of the phrase by the French philosopher Gaucher, who said, Christianity proved to be a religion that made it easy to leave religion. Well, that's what's happened in Europe. It has paved the way for ease of leaving from faith. No faith, you can believe whatever you want, you don't have to believe whatever you want. In that context, I think the intellectual discussions and the praxis of religious freedom becomes easy because there are already so many other intellectual freedoms that are circulating. But in societies where you don't have those kind of freedoms, religious freedom is an anomaly to so many people. Why should it be given a priority? Why should it be seen as part of a human dignity? There are so many other things that are a front to human dignity that religious freedom takes a back seat. I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm just trying to picture why hasn't it latched on? And I think I would just end by saying that, you know, there are not that many places that are safe to talk about religious freedom. We think of academic institutions as safe places for the raising of all sorts of ideas, and that the fact that Georgetown is doing this um, is to be commended. But there are really not that many safe places. Not necessarily because I think, as um, Tom Farr said this morning, that it's not really been taken up by academics, but I think a lot of academics either don't see this as a debate in its own right, or that they are fearful, not so much in the West, but largely across the world, where this might lead to. You have to be really brave, and you have to be courageous enough to take risks in your personal life to talk about religious freedom as a universal good for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mona. Um, my job as moderator is to stir up controversy. I don't think that'll be very hard. Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be easy for me to simply say, let's go down the line and talk about where you disagree. Because um, I, I think focusing in on those disagreements can be very helpful in structuring our conversation before we go and open things to the audience. I'll just try to provoke by um, quoting each of you on some of the basic issues, definitional and conceptual issues, to try to uh, lay the groundwork for, for where I see your, your disagreements. Professor Finnis, uh, religious freedom is a natural right, inherently universal, ought to be recognized everywhere. A cultural development in the direction of that recognition should take place universally around the world. Peter Danchin, religious freedom does not exist outside of cultural power, political contexts, it's normatively plural. And Mona, uh, your comments were cross-cutting. Uh, maybe there's some part of this debate that you might want to intersect with, but you raised the broader, truly global issues of defining religion across cultural contexts, the diversity of religious pra practices, uh, but also the very different uh, political contexts uh, and ways in which religious issues in many cases relate to or complicated by or overshadowed by other economic, political, and social concerns around the world. So that's just a way of trying to provoke you to, to help define some of the key questions, some of the key controversies that are at stake. John? Well, there are lots of things that uh, we, we could take up, but I, I, perhaps I'll just take up, start in from a remark that Mona made about uh, in the United Kingdom today, there's restiveness about the visibility of religious minorities or religious cultural minorities, about their visibility. Now, in my judgment, there is absolutely no such restiveness anywhere in the United Kingdom about the, res about the visibility of any religious minority except one. And similarly, in the European... Uh, Court of Human Rights' jurisprudence, uh, the, uh, the status of that one religion, the one talked about in Sahin and Rafa Partizi, is treated, I think correctly, uh, as quite distinct from that of other religions. It has its own character, its own dynamism. If I'm not mistaken, and if they're not mistaken, it, it's a religion not interested in religious freedom. Its own affirmations of religious freedom either negate it or uh, 
articulate something that doesn't match up to uh, our conception of, or my conception of, or the court's conception of religious freedom. The court judges that that's a permanent part of the dogma of Islam. That's part of the phrasing in, in uh, the cases. Now, you could say that's mistaken, and, and someone might say, no, that's mistaken. They're making a mistake about Islamic theology. They were being instructed in the case by Muslims, namely by the Muslims representing Turkey, which is a 98% Muslim country. The government of Turkey proposed this argument that Sharia must not be introduced because it's contrary to the European Convention. So uh, I don't think we can talk about all religions or all minority religions uh, in the same way. So the question of fact about whether the crucifix <coughs> represents something that's a threat to coer uh, coercive, of a coercive character or a threat to religious liberty is a question of fact. I have no brief for putting up crucifixes in public schools. I'm not terribly interested in it, and I don't have any special desire to defend it. But historically, it was put, it, it's the case because of a concordat between the Italian state and the Roman Catholic Church in the late 1920s. By the time the case came to court, at the motion of a Swedish uh, person in, in Italy in whatever, 2005, the Catholic religion had unambiguously adopted an absolutely straight conception of religious liberty. And so it was possible to argue, as, the, as Weiler and the Italians argued in 2009-10, what would have been impossible in 1928, namely that the crucifix now represents a religion that teaches religious freedom as part of its own dogma. And that gives you a, a, a sort of striking, as it were, factual historical uh, context. And it's, it's necessary to keep the, the distinctions within religion, the category of religion, very much uh, in mind. Uh, just about conscience. Conscience uh, is not an Enlightenment concept. It's a Christian con concept uh, taken over into the Enlightenment. It's in St. Paul. It's dramatized in a way that was shocking immediately, but rapidly accepted universally within Catholicism, it was dramatized by Aquinas' saying that you will certainly be mortally in sin if you defy your conscience. However vicious your conscience is, provided it is authentically yours, because your judgment of conscience is nothing other than your judgment about what you consider to be true. And so the value of truth is such that if you defect from that, you're bound to be in, in serious moral error, whatever the other errors that your judgment about the truth uh, may have involved. That, as it were, prestige of conscience is what is carried forward into the Enlightenment and, and shapes much of the Enlightenment, both its good features and, and its uh, bad. Uh, neutrality came into the uh, European jurisprudence about, human, about, about religious freedom in a way that's rather, rather hard to put one's finger on. Uh, I don't believe, unless I, I may be mistaken, but I, I don't believe that neutrality figures in the Muslim case, the Rafa and the Sahin cases, that uh, the Turkish state claimed to be secular and wanted to be secular against the Islamist parties in, in Turkey. But neutrality is another, another concept which emerges uh, from elsewhere in, the, in their jurisprudence. It, of course, corresponds, broadly speaking, to the no-establishment uh, doctrine in the United States. And I think, myself, it has come into the European jurisprudence by a kind of inertia, uh, inertial adoption of, of American ways of thinking. And you noticed this morning how, uh, for, well, at lunchtime, for, uh, for how, for example, Professor McConnell just treated it as axiomatic that if there was going to be talk about religious freedom, it had to match up with the talk about no establishment of religion. Whereas I think if you look at the European Convention or the international conventions as such, there's nothing about establishment, there's nothing about neutrality. There is something about coercion and freedom from coercion, and that's what really matters. What about this? <clears throat> basic fundamental question of the universality of religious freedom and Peter's argument that you really can't look at it in the abstract the way you approach it philosophically. 
because it's always embedded in different cultural, political, and so on contexts. You, you and or, I and all of us can effortlessly transcend the historical uh, by simply asking the question and answering it for ourselves. We're not mired in, in history. It's a little bit of hard work to understand the concepts that you will be, you started a thinking in terms of, and to subject those to some sort of immanent and external critique in order to get them fit for judgments that you want to commit yourself to, but it can be done, and that's the nature of, that's the nature of, of philosophy and of uh, sincere religious thought and of uh, natural science and of history as a discipline and not just a, as a subjection to propaganda, we, we jolly well better be able to transcend our historical context. Uh, otherwise, it's not worth uh, thinking. All right, Peter, can you, Peter, what do you say to that? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, I'll, I'll try to finish with that, because. Um, yeah. Can you start with that, just so we, we keep the flow of the conversation? Can you directly address what he just? said about we, can't be, we don't have to be mired in history, we can think about religious freedom outside of context? I, well, I, I agree in part, as mm -hmm. any pluralist would have to, that we can, we can try. And in fact, the best thing about the liberal tradition is the effort. Uh, but there, it is, in fact, in my view, impossible to transcend one's own situationality. That, the, that whatever efforts are made from the particular to grasp the universal, as it were, uh, one always falls back into some form of what I would call objective particularism. Uh, that there is always an effort made to define this position, but that the effort is always contingent. Uh, that, you know, that in a sense, we have to presuppose the possibility, but the tragedy, it seems, of the human condition is the impossibility of it. Um, but if I, could, if I could just return to the, the Rafar case, because I think this is where Professor Finnis and I most strongly uh, disagree. Um, in my view, this was the worst decision of the European Court of Human Rights has ever made uh, in its history. And I think scholars are starting to wake up to this. They got almost everything wrong in that case. And of course, subsequent events in Turkey bear out, I think, what I'm going to say. So, so which is the worst decision? The Refah the Refah Refah case. I see. The Refah Partizi case. Um, and I, I think I'm right to say, although some may disagree, that, that most human rights scholars would, would agree with me on this, and, and I want to explain uh, why. The important thing to realize about the, uh, the Justice and Development Party that was banned in this case, of course, the irony of banning the formation of a political party, which, of course, had demo a democratic platform. This is the critical thing in the case, that what the, the, the relevant party wanted to do was through the democratic <coughs> process make changes to the uh, legal system in Turkey. There's no doubt that the, the changes were proposed. But again, think about the context, right? Uh, you need to understand the history of the Kemalist project in Turkey to understand what the agenda of this political party was. My limited understanding of that history is that, uh, that from Ataturk on, a lot of that project, staunchly secularist in the sort of French general model, and backed up by the military, was seen increasingly by many Turks as undemocratic. Um, and so what, in a sense, we were seeing was a different form of contestation uh, democratically in Turkey uh, over the nature of the public sphere of the state itself. Uh, so this, this, is a, this is a very deep question about uh, what we mean by the limits of, of, uh, of democracy. And of course, what's striking about the case is how both the Turkish Constitutional Court and the Human Rights uh, Court in Strasbourg used the idea of religious freedom to limit the democratic aspirations uh, that were being expressed by this political party. Now, of course, that leaves open the question, what were those, what was that political platform? And uh, like Professor Finnis, I, I don't have the full facts. Uh, the, the, the one thing that seemed most at issue was this idea of a plurality of legal systems. And as Judge Kovla, the one dissenting judge, says in the Refar case, the, the court seems to suggest that the very idea of legal pluralism, the idea of religiously based law, the very idea that the Archbishop of Canterbury had just proposed in England and that we see existing in many democracies around the world, like India or South Africa, with all their vibrant pluralism and contestation amongst plural legal systems, the European court seems to say in Refar 
that that very concept itself is a violation of human rights. Now, I may be, I may be wrong about that, uh, but if that is what they do say, it seems to me a fatal mistake. Now, it, it could be that what they're saying is that Sharia, uh, as, a, as a form of law, is itself antithetical to human rights. And this, of course, is the most painful mistake uh, in the judgment, because in the last, I would say, 20 to 30 years, the amount of work that's been done in international human rights on uh, uh, Islamic legal systems and on Islam uh, broadly construed as a distinctive uh, legal system, which advances very uh, interesting and, and again contested notions of human rights, is a burgeoning field uh, in the world today. Um, and of course, the idea that Islam does not have a conception of human rights or of religious freedom itself is the third absolutely painful error in the judgment, because of course, if we look at the history of the Ottoman Empire, if we look at the millet system that evolved in that part of the world, still exists, of course, most prominently today in Israel, with all of its different religious courts, uh, a state we regard as a modern democracy, which has Sharia courts uh, and uh, Druze courts and rabbinic courts uh, and so on. This idea that, that one cannot have a plurality of legal systems within a modern democratic state if that's in fact what the court was saying, um, uh, I think is the third uh, terrible mistake. And of course, here, if we look at Italy, and I was just in Italy this summer, so I, I wanted to mention this. Uh, Professor Min uh, Finnis mentioned the Concordats, of course, the fascinating uh, reality in Italy today that, that um, uh, the Catholic Church has its own state. Uh, of course, everyone knows that, but it's remarkable when you think about it that within the sovereign territory of Italy, there is, in fact, a, a sovereign uh, a state, uh, which is in uh, certain treaty arrangements with the modern state of Italy, and very complex and politically negotiated uh, treaties between those two legal entities. What was fascinating to me in Italy was how, in Italian practice today, questions of religious freedom are being negotiated with minority religious communities. And what you actually see is the Italian state grappling to reach new forms of bilateral agreement with Muslim communities in Italy. Now, what's interesting about this is that they're trying to force the Italian Muslims into a kind of broadly uh, Italian Christian form of uh, religious freedom arrangement. Right? They don't know who to contract with or how to structure it. Uh, but religious freedom in, in Italy today means the state negotiating with minority communities, much as, in a sense, the, uh, uh, within the Islamic tradition, there is a conception of minority autonomy for, for uh, different communities. Um, right. so, you, so, you... so just to conclude, right. if, if we ask what religious freedom means today in Italy, it means a very complex and unequal uh, set of arrangements between majority and minority communities uh, but I don't think we would want to deny that that is a form of uh, religious freedom. Mona, would you like to jump in before we open it up? <coughs> sure. Just to clarify one point here, which is the, the notion of Sharia. This is such a contested word in Islamic jurisprudence amongst Muslim scholars. But I think the, the faults, when, um, with all respect, when the West talks about Sharia, it talks about a monolith. It talks about an Islamic legal system. Sharia was never an Islamic legal system. Um, aspects of Sharia could have been applied, but most of Sharia was an elaboration of Islamic jurisprudence. And this is why today it's become such an important part um, of the legal vocabulary and the human rights discourse, because Muslims as well, Muslim scholars as well as non-Muslim scholars are trying to debate what is it about the Islamic law system or Islamic legal jurisprudence that has, that has aspects or that has glimmers of human rights, human dignity, etc but which we in the West see namely through oppressive systems. And I think that we need a more nuanced and more sophisticated understanding of what Islamic jurisprudence is before we think about Sharia. I agree, I'm the first person to say that the major community that is problematic in Europe and in the UK in recent years, not in the last 40, 50 years, but in only recent years, is the Muslim community. But I can also add that there are numerous examples of Sikhs and Hindus and other, other communities that are saying, we are being ignored at the expense of the Muslim community. We also have our issues, we also have our problems, but nobody pays any attention to us. And part of the problem of that is that the Muslim communities, 
It's absolutely right that where, when they um, react with violence or aggression, it of course makes headlines. But I think we also have to understand that there is not just a, uh, a dislike for religion in the public space in Europe, especially in the UK, because if it was just about the Muslim community, they wouldn't have a dislike about Christian voices either. And it's this, it's this recognition that religion harks back to a medieval era. Whereas secularism, which is not anti-religious, but anti-theocratic, is forward-looking. Secularism allows for pluralism. Religion, even if we think of John Milbank's idea of the return of Christendom, which I know a lot of people applaud, but a lot of people are critical of, because what kind of Christendom will Europe look like? And what kind of Christendom will be applauded by those very liberals who only want other people to be liberal? So for me, a secular, a secular concept of a pluralist society is a good thing. I would in no way think about multiple religious systems. And when the Archbishop and Rowan Williams was talking about Sharia, he actually no way said that there should be other parallel legal systems. He was talking about a reality that many Muslims, as well as Jews, already have certain practices that are legal in their religious tradition, which they, um, which they practice and which are not contested by the state. How do we allow for a broadening of this to understand that there may be other things that could be not contested, but part of their religious thinking. Not that there should be a parallel criminal system or anything like that. So for a concrete example, it's perfectly fine for someone like me to say I would like halal meat in the name of my religion, privately and publicly. But it is not fine for someone like me to say that I believe in honor killings because in some cultures, Islamic cultures, honor killings are part of the Islamic faith. And I think we are collapsing too many extremes under the rubric of religious freedom. And I, and I just want to say one final thing, that this isn't about the Islamic world with its oppressive and rather medieval looking um, ethical frameworks, which are to some extent justified um, as a criticism against a very liberal post-Christian West. This is really about how do different cultures and religions live meaningfully in a pluralist society, not just in silence, but in, but in true meaning. And I think that is not a situation where we've got to yet. Thank you, Mona. Um, I know the panel would like to jump in, but I really want to open the floor for some questions, and then you'll have an opportunity to um, direct some remarks to, to the colleagues on the panel as well. We have two mics. Let's collect um, three questions. There's a question in the back over here and a question in front over here. We'll start with those two. Yes. Hi. I'm Amjad Chaudhary. I'm from uh, Amdiya Muslim community. Uh, I think this religious freedom, uh, it can be defined in a different way because this is the religion that is by God. And there's only one God. And there was Moses, there was Jesus, there was Muhammad, and Ahmed, peace be on all of them. Uh, they brought, they came Could in. Could you ask a question, please? The question is mm -hmm. that they came in and they were suppressed and their uh, religious freedom was prohibited. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, these, uh, these they, they grow up in, in in, the, in their religious freedom. And I'm saying that uh, uh, Ahmad, he was the last one, and he brought a, he said the God sowed the seed. And the, uh, this uh, uh, tree will grow up and its branches will be all over the world. And I'm saying, uh, we talk about religious freedom, but this is what the God plan is. And, that's what happens in all, all of right. the... Well, maybe we can, uh, uh, building off your comment, the, the issue of the missionary impulse in Islam, let's say, or Christianity, and how that relates to issues of religious freedom around the world. Yeah. Um, Roger Drake from Oxford, and also with this Religious Freedom Project. 
Uh, on the subject of uh, r religious freedom being uh, both plural and normatory, normatively plural and uh, not universal, uh, that means it's rooted in a context, as you say. Uh, I assume, then, that means that we can't rationally criticise other people uh, for not living up to the norm of religious freedom, except as it just being an expression of our own particular culture. So that, for instance, if Americans criticise Pakistanis for lapses from the ideal of religious freedom, they're doing no more than saying, I wish they'd play baseball, not cricket. Is that right. what you are really saying? Okay, good. good. Um, one more question over here before we go back to the panel, and then I'll collect some more. Yeah. Please stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on the question of coercion, because it seems to me that's what Lao Tse turned on. And so, John, you talked a lot about freedom of religion, including freedom, not freedom from coercion. I would like for you to say a few more words about what coercion means. And particularly, I think you said you have a right not to, to be free from coercion, even in the context of your family or your community, and what that might mean. Okay, let's, uh, I'd ask the panelists to be brief so we can collect uh, some more responses. Peter, why don't we start with you? Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Um, thank you for your, your question. This, this, of course, is always the uh, response to, to pluralists from people who claim um, uh, a universal position. And, of course, the basic charge is that pluralism is really relativism. Uh, and so what I want to insist is that there is a normative difference between a relativist and a, and a pluralist position. And the, I think the person who's done the best work on this, for my mind, is Akhil Bulgrami at uh, Columbia. Um, and it gets to some of the earlier discussion we had about, about Locke uh, and, of course, Locke's refusal to extend toleration to atheists. Um, I, I'm being a little ellipt uh, obscure here, but the way I see the difference um, is that one can indeed have a rational conversation with uh, people from different uh, cultures or, or normative traditions than oneself. Um, uh, the, the, the point of disagreement is whether there is a position superior to the position of the two discussants by which that criticism can be uh, legitimated as, the, as correct. Right? And what a pluralist wants to suggest is that there, that position is simply unavailable that one has to advance one's, rational, uh, one's reasoned arguments on the basis of uh, one's own tradition, one's own uh, situation, as it were, uh, and that where the possibility for rational dialogue comes is when one tries to take the internal position of the person one's talking with, uh, and where one sees uh, one's interlocutor as having some uh, incoherence or, or uh, conflicts within their own normative tradition that opens up the space for uh, pointing that out and engaging in a dialogue as to how one might reconcile that, um, uh, that uh, conflict within the other tradition, uh, as it were. And of course, that then comes back into the one's own position. Uh, what Belgrami has argued is that it's only if someone is a monster of coherence, as he puts it, as if, as if the interlocutor has no internal conflict within their own moral position then in, indeed the specter of relativism would exist. And I would have to concede that. But in reality, uh, this is not how things work. In reality, one can always engage in discussions with, with someone else while assuming that one's own position is correct. Uh, what I think is the great conceit of, uh, of much discourse today is that there is some position external to the two uh, interlocutors. And that's what I want to uh, deny. Could I, can I just jump in? Because this is such a critical issue. Um, might not the Universal Declaration of Human Rights represent such an external authority, uh, a set of sort of universal truths that might frame the kinds of debates US, Pakistani, and so on? And if not, why not? Well, and that's a great, that's a great example, because as we heard, uh, Professor Finnis uh, thinks that there is normative dissonance between the Universal Declaration and the ICCPR, which is, in fact, the, the legal codification of that. So Article 18 of the ICCPR is normatively different to Article 18 of the UDHR. And of course, both of those are different to the Cairo Declaration on uh, Human Rights. So, so who's got the universal position? You think they're all equally good? No, no, I don't. But I well, think, which one is, is superior? I think we'd have, we'd have to uh, argue about that. I don't well, think I'm going to propose that Article 18 of the Universal Declaration is superior 
because it articulates the right to change one's religion, and the other two are inferior, the Islamic one radically inferior, because it, that, that one implicitly denies that right. The, the intermediate one, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, leaves in shadow, under pressure from the Muslim states, that question of whether you can change your religion. And yes. it can be interpreted one way or the other. So it's got, a, it's got the defect of ambiguity uh, as well as other defects. Well, see, and I think the reason I disagree so strongly with that is, is, is for two reasons. Um, I think in your making that judgment, you're assuming a position that is particular to a, a tradition you are particularly attached to, which, of course, is your right. Um, but secondly, what's really interesting about this disagreement is that in 1948, when the Universal Declaration was, was uh, written, most of the states in the so-called Muslim world were not at the table. Right? When Article 18 was drafted, in fact, there, right. there, there was no actual uh, attempt to ask these states what they thought about Article 18. Mm -hmm. When that actual effort was made in the intervening 20-odd years to the ICCPR, disagreement was voiced. Yeah, they said no right to change. Well, they, uh, and and they, that's a very serious defect. I, see, I mean, I, are, you, are you saying it's defensible to say no one can change their religion or perhaps the position actually being asserted is no one can change from Islam, but anyone what? can change, has a right to change, indeed a duty to change, from atheism or other religions to Islam. Oh. You think that's universally defensible? No. no. But then your, let, let's go back to your basic position, which is that there are no universally defensible positions. They're all tradition, except that one. Uh, and uh, I just don't see any rationality to the claim that there's one position that's exempt, namely the one that tells you all positions are tradition-based and you can't get outside your tradition. There, there, there may well be a, uh, a bit... There, there, of course, there must be better or worse positions. The difficulty we face on the Cairo Declaration is that the 50-odd states, is it 50, I think, that are parties to that declaration... Uh, disagree at a normative level with Article 18 of the UDHR. So that's we, my point. That's yeah. right. And so you think that they're wrong about that. But what I think is interesting about their disagreement is that I think in those uh, societies and in those traditions, there is a different understanding of religion and religious subjectivity, right? That once one thinks about religion in a more communal sense, the sense is one being claimed by a moral community as opposed to in a, a kind of enlightenment or, uh, autonomy-based sense. Um, or a conscience-based sense, and I, I, I don't mean to run those two th things together. Once one thinks outside of those traditions, it may be that the freedom to change religion is a more difficult question. Yes, obviously that's the case. Yeah. I mean, you're just saying that they've got a different position, and it's one that doesn't, isn't interested in conscience or autonomy or authenticity, no, I'm not saying but that. in communal subscription to a supposed truth, which, however, is not to be subjected to critical analysis with the possibility of coming out with a different answer. That's all absolutely self-evident. Um, the question is whether that's a defensible position. As you said, there are better and worse positions. Is mm -hmm. that defensible as better than the Christian Enlightenment position that you have duties and rights of conscience and autonomy and authenticity, and they include religion. Isn't, is, do, you, do you want to say that the Christian Enlightenment position is inferior to the Islamic one? I don't want to say that, but I, I don't want to rule out the possibility that uh, the, the other position has its merits as well. And I think that process, is that dialogue is unfolding. Okay, let, let me, um, as much as I hate to cut short that conversation, I do want to make sure we get some more questions in before we run out of time. Um, Dan, you had a question here, and then there are two questions that will follow on right after that. Dan? No, my, my question has been played out. Oh, okay, then let's start back there with uh, Jean Sebastien, and then, or oh, that's fine. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, please stand I'm up and, and briefly identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Shafa. I'm from uh, Al Walid Bintala Center for Christian Muslim Understanding, but I'm from Indonesia. Um, I just would like to make a comment uh, to Professor uh, Finnish, and um, with my be best uh, uh, what is the regard to you, and um, to let you know that Islam is like um, any other religion. Islam is not a monolithic religion, so there is no a single interpretation that should be absolutized. So even though there is an Islamic declaration of, of human rights, 
I think no one, uh, there is not, uh, not binding for, for any Muslim actually. So that, that uh, uh, what is that my comment to you? So uh, actually, if- Do you have a we, question too? Yeah, uh, my question is actually, um, do you think that if there are, any pro if there are problems in the world, for example, uh, conflict between religions. Is that because of religion? I mean, is religion is a problem. Okay. I think because, for example, like uh, in Mumbai, there is a conflict between India and, in, in, and Islam. Is that because of, of religion itself or themselves? Because in Indonesia, there, there are almost never conflict between uh, Hinduism and Islam. Even if in Indonesia, uh, there is a ban for Ahmadiyya, for example, that's about uh, freedom of religion, but that's only in a certain place. For example, like in, okay. in Eastern, okay. um, uh, what is it, in, in Western uh, Java, in West Java, but not in Central Java, for example. So my question is, religion, uh, 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 according to you, religion is a problem? Or how, yeah. And how religion relates to these other economic, social, political forces, yep. Second question. Uh, Jean-Sébastien Ma, undergraduate student within uh, the, the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. Um, all of you have ta has tackled uh, the universality of the concept of religious freedom, but one can observe that uh, this concept is understood and implemented very differently uh, depending on the country or region one looks at. Uh, obviously, there is an American understanding uh, of this concept, a European, maybe French, Turkish one, and also an Asian, and, uh, and we can say an Arabic understanding of, uh, of this concept. So given this empirical diversity, can we still speak about one only universal concept of religious freedom? And if not, what are the prospects, according to you, uh, regarding such a universality? Thank you. All right, we have time for let's one more question here. Um, <coughs> that's right, right there in the third row. We can throw in the two questions if you keep it brief. Uh, Kathy Cosman, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. There's another body. It's not uh, uh, treat doesn't have le international legal status, but that's OSCE. Nicole Durham is much more expert on on uh, the OSCE aspect than I am. But I did want to also point out that there's another. Uh, tradition that hasn't been discussed at all, and that's the Orthodox Christian tradition. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it has definitions of religious freedom. I, I, I think probably not so well developed, but I'd be interested in hearing opinions on that, and maybe Cole could say something about OSCE. It has, Thank you. It's okay. very widely, you know, it's a very elaborate, yes. elaborated definition. All right, final question, and then we'll move to the panel. Um, getting back to the question about whether um, the communal understanding is correct or not, um, having lived in India and seen how those who uh, chose to leave um, uh, Islam or Hinduism, mostly Hinduism in India, um, could actually be penalized, and there was a recent, uh, recent decision made that it's illegal by the, um, by the Hindu party in India, um, that often what happens is, is that there are other economic and social issues related to that conversion decision, and so that the anti-conversion law can also be used to uh, suppress economic um, and other rights. So it can be a shield for many other inequities in the system. Thank you. So I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to answer from among those questions, maybe one or two, and also provide some final reflections. So we'll start with... Professor Finnis. The important thing uh, to put up in the front is that uh, the propositions of, say, the Universal Declaration and the, the proposition that I, de I defended was not defended as Christian or as emerging from any other religious tradition, but as natural or human rights available to any reasoning person willing to inform themselves about the basic facts of the human situation and the whole cosmic situation and think about it deeply uh, and, and go from there. They might end up in a religion, they might not. Uh, that's for them to discover and it's deeply important that they should discover it and discover it for themselves with whatever help they have and that it be theirs and not something that is a matter of pretense <laughs> 
or of subjection to coercion, which in, in, entails inauthenticity. So whether the Orthodox have got a different tradition from the Catholics and so forth, and whether the Catholic Church, you know, between 1928 and 1965 changed its position, that's all of great interest, but it's not fundamental to the, to the matter. Uh, now, it, in the Islamic Declaration on Human Rights, you have the proposition prominently stated that all these declarations of human rights are subject to Sharia, and it's said twice, all the rights and freedoms stipulated in this declaration are subject to the Islamic Sharia. And secondly, the Islamic Sharia is the only source of reference for the explanation or clarification of any of the articles of this declaration. Now, this, this is a radically different uh, way of thinking about all this, and, it's, and it, it needs to be taken seriously. It's, it's very important that there are scholars arguing and, and investigating the content uh, and arguing with each other about the content of Sharia, and that's splendid and it's to be encouraged. The European Court of Human Rights and the Turkish Constitutional Court did not have the luxury of waiting for advanced scholars to emerge with some concept of Sharia that would be compatible with democracy or with human rights. They had to act in the, in, the, in the knowledge that very probably, unless they acted, an Islamic political party would take over Turkey and repeal the 60 or 70 years of Kemalist secularist uh, government, a government of Muslims by Muslims, and that that would be a one-way street. And that, that it's a one-way street is of huge historical importance. It, those two cases, Rafe, well, Rafa Partizi and the Sahin case, remind us explicitly of the European con concept, which I think Americans also need to at least start thinking about, of militant democracy, of G a state like Germany, which was thoroughly democratic and taken over from inside by parties operating in elections and, as a, and by referenda. <coughs> So as a result, the, the modern German constitution forbids referenda, and it authorizes the constitutional court to dissolve parties which are intending to subvert the constitution, including the right of religious freedom and the right to hold genuine dem democratic and free elections. Democracy is not a sort of self-validating concept of having elections and so forth. That's what experience taught the Euro Europeans. So they can't afford the luxury of seeing whether some benign interpretation of Sharia would emerge if the Islamic political party took over in Turkey. They had to act. There was dispute within the court about whether it was imminent enough for them to take the radical step of dissolving the party. And some of the minority judges, the British judge, thought it, it wasn't near enough. But the others thought, well, gee, you've only got one shot. Uh, and so you better err on the side of, of, of caution. And we can, we can argue about that. But the important thing is uh, there is a historic given Sharia, and modern discussions amongst advanced scholars don't yet represent anything like the substance of Sharia that political people, voters, courts have to meditate and deliberate about and make decisions about. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, thank you. I, I of course, um, I guess it won't be a surprise that I, I disagree. Um, uh, the notion that uh, Sharia is a source or the source of law, uh, and it's a shame that Noah Feldman is not here because he, in a sense, has raised this issue most, most acutely, is to me a very suggestive and fascinating question. What does that mean? And that I would encourage everyone to, to, to think about and try to explore because, as, as was mentioned from the floor, there is no monolithic uh, answer to that question, and the, and the traditions of ijtihad and so on within different Islamic schools of interpretation are truly fascinating as to how a jurisprudence based on uh, a, a revelation uh, unfolds historically and politically. And, and for example, if one looks at the, at the jurisprudence of the uh, Egyptian Court of Human Rights, which unfortunately is not available in English, it's all in Arabic, but there is some translation now emerging, it's quite clear that based on interpretations of um, uh, relevant Islamic legal sources, um, th that court has been recognized within <coughs> Egypt as broadly progressive over the last 20 or so years. In fact, upholding uh, the limitations on the wearing of the niqab, interestingly. Mm -hmm. 
And um, we'll see how its jurisprudence unfolds in the next 20, 15 years. Right. Yeah. Um, but if, if I could just say, finish with a word about, yeah. um, uh, about Refah and this notion of militant democracy. This is very important to me because I think what it raises, is, it raises most acutely is the question of power and of force. And the idea that we need to defend these effective commitments we have to the secular and to the individual as the, as the source of our normative order through force if necessary, through military means, whether in Turkey or in Iraq or in Afghanistan or elsewhere, that these are things that we're willing to fight for uh, and defend through military force, I think is, is, is very interesting. Now, my understanding is that that party that was banned in Refah is today the government. Many of those members are today the government in Turkey yeah. and are recognized as, as really moving progressively on a whole host of issues, such as uh, the rights of the Kurds within Turkey. Now, I'm no expert on this, but I think that's a, a very interesting thing to look at. Um, the, the, the last point I wanted to make is that this critique of Sharia as a source of law rests on a previous assertion that there is some alternative, that there is some notion of freedom uh, in, in a sense, the Enlightenment is a, as an escape from this dilemma. And if I read Kant, and this is a much longer discussion, what Kant, the genius of Kant, in a sense, in the great reversal of this discourse, was to posit that a self-critical reason, a reason that's premised uh, on the individual and the, and the use of critical reason, uh, has to commit what reason dictates as duty. In other words, integral to the Kantian scheme is a very, very strongly binding morality which requires us to take the rights of every individual into account. So that, I, and this is a question for Professor Finnis, am I correct to assert that individual freedom itself imposes duties on us? The moral right to religious freedom or individual freedom imposes duties on us from which we cannot uh, uh, exempt ourselves. We have no choice but to accept the, the moral right to equal freedom. And if that's the case, what is the freedom that's being claimed and advanced by military means if necessary? Is it not possible for a political party in a country like Turkey with years of enforced secularism through democratic elections to vote to change the nature of their legal system? Is that something that we are saying is not a valid choice? I, 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 I can't reconcile these two positions. Mona, you've got the last last word. I'm <clears throat> just trying to think on the basis of both of the last comments. I think the critical question could be that in much of the Islamic world, aside from the scholars, especially scholars who are working in the West, who are trying to reformulate these kind of debates within the context of human rights and the moral commitment to human rights for all, which includes religious freedom, <coughs> why is it that in many parts of the Islamic world, this is a huge generalization to make, but I think it stands, that there is still a commitment to a, an old order of Sharia, not a new order, if I can put it like that. So that when communities, when societies do get a chance to reform, why is it that so many are still wanting some kind of Sharia legislation when they have the freedom to vote for a secular or a non-Sharia-based government? And I think we, I haven't been able to resolve that myself. And I think this is one of the biggest conundrums that people in the West are facing, is that why is there amongst many Muslim communities a commitment to not Sharia in the abstract, but to a Sharia which undermines the values, the software of democracies, let me put it like that, the values of the West, which is about pluralism, equal rights for all, and the freedom to, to live your life morally as you wish. Why is it that Muslims forsake that, and sometimes very violently, for, another, for an alternative social and legal order? Um, even when they're not coerced. And I think, to some extent, that is, in this debate, but also in other debates, a conundrum that we're facing. Um, I do want to say one thing, however, is that we shouldn't However much we have a moral right and moral commitment, and I think a moral imperative to keep this debate going and to criticize those Muslim communities or Islamic regimes that do oppress, oppress for all sorts of reasons. 
I don't think we should be oblivious to the fact that we are not comparing like for like. Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are not the UK or the USA. Um, and we have, to be we have to be very careful that the political social order of these communities, as well as the economic order of these, dictates to a large extent how people think. Thank you, Mona. This is, um, it's been a great discussion. Uh, it's been a great day. And of course, we've raised a lot more questions than we could answer. Happily, this is the beginning of a multi-year project. And we look forward to continuing these explorations with all of you over the coming years. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the great work of uh, Tom Farr and Tim Shaw and Kyle Vandermulen, the other members of our Berkeley Center staff who made the event possible. I'd like to thank you all for coming and ask you to join me in thanking our panels. Thank you.